um, it's yeah, really cool to be able to speak at this event. Um, my name is Vian. I um, have, yeah, I guess where to start. So I recently, earlier this year, came back from a year in Rojava where I was working um, with the movement there behind the sort of Rojava revolution and working within the structures of the revolution. Um, before that, I've been based in the UK for about 15 years and have been involved in social justice struggles um, throughout that time, um, many in the sort of like uh, anti-climate change ecological movement and then also in the feminist and anarchist movements as well. Um, mostly based in the south of England, then we're about to move north um, this weekend. Um, so uh, in terms of like, I kind of started off in a very sort of direct action kind of anarchist movement space. And then after a lot of like really difficult, um, you know, kind of sort of burnout -y, kind of imploding, horrible sort of stuff I was involved in, and then ended up kind of like retreating almost into the community food growing world. So I ended up doing quite a lot of work with communities, with local agriculture and with ecology through the lens of actually growing things, like actually working the soil and working with people, um, but then kind of felt uh, a need to sort of like get back stuck into more direct campaigning and action sort of stuff, um, which was also a transition that was, I think, was already underway, but was really made more extreme by the death of Anna Campbell, who went to Rojava to fight um, against fascism and was killed a couple of years ago by Turkish airstrike. And she was an old friend of mine. Um, so I think her death also like really spurred me to make the decision to go to Rojava and to work um, with the ecological movement there, um, as well as the women's movement. So I ended up doing like ecological work. I ended up working a bit with the Make Rojava Green Again campaign. Um, and then lots of other stuff as well. Um, ended up doing lots of press work and going to a lot of like education sessions and things like that. So I came back earlier this year, um, just in time for lockdown, and I'm working with the Kurdistan Solidarity Network and the Kurdish movement, the Kurdish community in the UK. Um, and so I was asked to speak about women and ecology in the Rojava Revolution in North and East Syria. Um, and I'm kind of assuming that most people who are coming to this meeting um, know roughly kind of what the situation is. I'm going to give a very quick overview, but also really want to encourage people to that if you have specific questions or if there's terms I'm using that you don't understand or you just want to um, find out a bit more about, please use the chat box and I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, and maybe Sam, you can as well. Um, while I'm talking so I can kind of expand on stuff which isn't obvious to people because there's a lot of kind of stuff that um, it's hard to know everything about. I'm going to make a lot of references to things that not everybody will understand. Um, the main kind of overview I would give about the Rojava revolution is that the Kurdish freedom movement for, I mean, hundreds of years, but particularly since the 60s in its kind of specific incarnation as um, an anti-colonialist, um, anti-fascist struggle, um, has existed sort of in the region of Kurdistan, which is the region traditionally populated by Kurdish people, but that's split between the borders of Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran um, because of imperialism, um, has become one of the most like, I guess, inspiring and momentous um, revolutionary movements in the contemporary world. I guess like in many ways taking place alongside the Zapatistas, um, but in a very different context um, and has developed from a kind of very traditional like um, national liberation struggle that was very influenced by kind of a traditional state socialist model into something that's based on what they call the new paradigm which is centered around three pillars of women's liberation ecological sustainability and radical democracy so um you know those three things are three things that like i think as as people who are fighting for a radically different world can all sort of um, gather around and the scale of social change that's happening in North and East Syria under the Rojava revolution is um, really breathtaking and I was, I feel very privileged to have been able to see it firsthand and to see the huge, huge um, life-changing, world-changing things which are happening in North and East Syria in terms of women's liberation, in terms of um, an ecological anti-capitalist economy and in terms of like a people-centered governance in which the 
the movement rejects the structure of the state and instead encourages and supports communities to govern themselves and then work together and federate up into kind of an, a non-state governance system. So it's really um, amazing and incredibly inspiring. So um, we'll try to talk a little bit today about the specific issues of um, women's liberation feminism and ecology and sustainability. Um, but what inevitably happens is um, all these issues tie into a million other issues. So this talk always will become a talk about everything. So we're just going to take a bit of the chaotic tour through um, the politics and context of the Rojava revolution and the Kurdish freedom movement. Okay, so is there anything uh, sort of in particular that stuck in your mind during your time in Rojava, um, particularly around like feminism and ecology? Yeah, so I think I went to Rojava with kind of, um, despite my best intentions, despite like quite like a Western framing of feminism and of ecology and actually in some ways seeing them like as an issue. Um, whereas in the Kurdish freedom movement, like ecology is essentially a framework, like it's the foundation and it's not just the thing you're campaigning on it's not just the issue you're trying to promote but it's actually like the basis and the framework and the worldview the lens through which you kind of see all of your political action so it's incredibly integrated like into a wider system which is um quite different than like you know in the uk i think we're all quite aware of um you know you can have a lot of sort of like green capitalism or like environmental groups that operate in a very like neoliberal way but in general, with the Kurdish freedom movement, there's a really strong understanding that, you know, you have to have this kind of consistency between like the ends and the means. And if you want to work for an ecological future, you need to work in an ecological way, um, while at the same time not getting caught up into these like really sort of dogmatic and purist kind of things around, um, you know, not using plastic bags or like always recycling and things like that and kind of saying, well, yes, a lot of these things are really um, important, but actually we do need to look about like um, systems and structures. We need to look about the values that we're united around. Um, we need to look at how we see the world, how we conceptualize truth and kind of how we relate to each other, how we see power, how we make decisions and actually see all of these things as ecological and see all of these things as um, through kind of like anti-patriarchal lens as well. And I used to always kind of, you know, like a few days after I arrived, like I was given the job of like, you know, dealing with like the trash, the the rubbish, and the way that you often deal with rubbish in Rojava is um, you pour diesel on it and then you burn it. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I came here to do like ecological work and here I am like burning trash with diesel. Like this isn't really what I imagined myself doing as part of this like ecological revolution. Um, but I mean, like, first of all, it goes without saying that there's a lot of like incredibly like practical challenges that the people in North and East Syria are facing um, to have like the kind of ecological, I guess, you know, lifestyle or, um, or systems in place that, that they want. You know, you know, there's like an economic blockade, there's constant um, war, there's attacks by either ISIS or kind of Al Qaeda affiliates, or now more recently, like, well, for a long time now, the Turkish state as well. Um, there's, you know, internal conflict um, caused by like forces still um, kind of from the Assad regime. There's an internal conflict from kind of more capitalist forces as well. So there's like a lot of like things that they have to do before they're able to like implement like an amazing, for example, recycling system. And there's a lot of appetite for it. Like, um, you know, I've sat down and spoken to the people who are in charge of the kind of water and waste um, and energy for the region of Jazeera, so the easternmost region. Um, and, you know, they have these like amazing ideas about like having an entirely like solar powered um, fleet of like garbage trucks, which connect, collect um, rubbish from all around the region and then like sort it. And it's very state of the art, it's very sustainable. But they're like, yeah, but then it would cost like, you know, four million dollars so for now what we're trying to do is this like for now what we're trying to do is a little bit of gray water you know here a little bit of recycling there and it's that's something that I was really struck by this ability to just completely juggle these like huge big picture questions and these huge ambitious projects with the kind of like nuts and bolts of every day how do we make the best decisions that we can based you know in, in the kind of complicated situation we're in. And I think that's something that I, I don't see as much um, here. 
in the in the organizing I've been involved in, I feel like we quite often get a little bit stuck um, when we kind of come up against contradictions or tensions or inconsistencies. And um, fundamentally, we get a little bit dogmatic. And I think that's partly because we we don't have this um, kind of positive vision that a lot of us are united around, like a lot of us know. And of course, this is different for everybody, you know, every individual and every kind of movement and group. But I feel like in general, um, we know what we're against, but we sometimes struggle to know what we're for. And because we tend to unify around things that we're against, then we can become quite insecure around um, people who see things a bit differently from us because we can't be like, okay, well, this is what I believe in. But because in Rojava, people say, I really believe in ecology, women's liberation and grassroots democracy. And I believe in an anti-capitalist economy and a non-state governance system. Like, and we're making it, we're making it happen. And we see it in front of us. People actually feel a lot more solid in what they believe in. And they're able to kind of work through those contradictions and uncertainty. Um, so I guess that's kind of one thing I was really struck with the ability to do that um, and therefore the ability to be quite unified and to work across a huge range of people with a lot of different kind of like angles and ideas and opinions to bring people together and to really kind of celebrate what we can achieve when we all work together um, and that's partly because there's been a lot of having to unify in the face of external threats in the face of like invasion and external enemies um, but there is something about having that kind of political clarity and that clarity of thought to say, well, this is what we're trying to accomplish and therefore we're going to keep on working towards it. And um, one example of kind of like what that could look like is, is how the women's movement is so unified and so strong across North and East Syria. And it involves, you know, there's Kurdish women, but then there's a lot of Arab women, Chechen, you know, Turkmen, Assyrian, like it's actually quite an ethnically diverse region. Um, there's people from different like economic backgrounds, different levels of education, um, cities versus kind of rural. But at the same time, there's a big effort to kind of bring people together. Um, and through that, you're able to, for example, confront patriarchal behavior because in general, the women are speaking with a more unified voice. So if there's um, an instance of patriarchy, for example, like there was one example where like a man behaved inappropriately towards a woman that actually the women's movement across the whole movement said, we're not going to talk to that guy anymore for six months or a year. And there was just this uniform kind of like, you know, he threatened violence against the woman. So we're not going to acknowledge his existence. Um, and just pretty much like was able to make that decision across essentially like tens of thousands of women um, in a way that is only possible when you have that, that unity behind a shared purpose and behind like a shared series of values. Um, so that's the kind of like daydream I have as well for kind of the work that we can do here um, more broadly is to kind of figure out how we can figure out what we believe in, what we're fighting for, and then like all kind of like rally behind it. That's great. Um... How does the Kurdish freedom movement see the relationship between the women's liberation and the environmental sustainability? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if we could do like maybe a bit of like a sort of interactive thing that if people want to type in the chat box, um, kind of how in the work that you do, you see a link between um, feminism and ecological sustainability. Like I'd be really interested to hear what you guys say. Um, and also, Molly, I see your question, and I'll try to return to it a little bit later, but remind me if I don't. Um, but for now, yeah, if people can like throw in the chat box kind of how they see that connection between ecology and feminism, that would be super interesting. Um, so kind of like how I um, started off saying the kind of idea of seeing ecology and women's liberation as like a whole framework, as a whole worldview, um, and not necessarily as an issue. I think um, that's like, if you take almost a step back, you kind of see the whole framework is around domination, right? Like that's the kind of main kind of fundamental building block of analysis of the Kurdish freedom movement. So in the writings of the Kurdish freedom movement, which are mostly by Abdullah Öcalan, um, who has been in solitary confinement on an island prison by the Turkish state for the past 20 years. Um, so he's a political prisoner, but he's actually produced a lot of writing while he's been in prison. Um, he refers to women as the first colony. And that goes back to the Kurdish freedom movement as an anti-colonial struggle, 
um, as you know, the Kurdish populations in Turkey and Syria, Iraq and Iran, um, reacting against um, the colonization from the state power that they were kind of under the governance of. Um, so there is this kind of idea that if you zoom back, you know, 5,000, 7,000 years, when things like the state and patriarchy and environmental exploitation were starting to emerge, that we have to link all these ideas together, that the domination of women by men was inherently linked to beginning to see um, humans as separate from nature instead of part of it and actually enacting domination on nature. And similarly, the emergence of the class system and those kind of with capital and resources, dominating those without, and the emergence of state structures um, in which those in power dominate those who are not in power. Um, so that's kind of like the theoretical connection um, in a lot of ways. Um, so it's kind of seeing all these relationships of domination and therefore saying as a movement, we're fighting against domination for a free, liberated, dignified life for everybody. Um, and through that kind of connection of um, women's liberation and ecological sustainability, you're then able to kind of celebrate like the diversity of um, different communities coming together of like rejecting the concept of like a state which imposes one identity on everyone behind underneath it. And instead to kind of say, well, we are, our strength comes from our diversity. It has that kind of like ecological model of saying, well, if you look at nature, nature creates very diverse, vibrant ecosystems um and not monocultures but then it was that kind of break where like humans start to see themselves as not part of nature anymore that kind of enabled us to start exploiting nature in the first place um well no one's saying anything in the chat come on guys <laughs> i want to hear from you otherwise i'm just gonna have to talk forever um but yeah so i guess um there's also this kind of like idea of like um, women, um, which the Kurdish word is jin, and life, which is jian, kind of seeing actually a connection between like women and life, women and nature in that way as well. Um, and so you kind of see that a little bit in a lot of indigenous communities as well, specifically in North America, where you see in the kind of traditional sense that women are often connected to the land and often have like the responsibility of being the um, holders of like the seed for the next year or doing a lot of that kind of agricultural kind of work which connects them to nature. Um, oh fantastic, under capitalism I see an ecological and feminist perspective as essential for liberation because both are sites of exploitation and expropriation. Our material selves, our bodies, our labor are invisible but keep the entire system running. A society that recognizes how our lives are intertwined and dependent on care for each other and not seeing the natural world as something external or outside of humanity is crucial. Um, yeah, exactly. I think so much of um, kind of, again, it's really about like, however deep you go, you need to go deeper. Um, you know, so a lot of environmental campaigns right now, even quite radical ones are all about kind of like protecting nature and like defending nature, but then making that next step to saying, well, actually, defending nature is defending ourselves. We don't exist without nature. Um, and not kind of seeing humans as something that like hurt nature, not seeing nature as broken, but seeing our relationships to it as broken and kind of seeing that as, um, as the broken thing that we need to address. Um, so now when we're talking about this kind of like link between like women and nature, I think I want to just kind of directly kind of confront and engage in the kind of question of sort of like biological essentialism um, and this kind of, um, yeah, this reaction that I certainly had when I first encountered how the Kurdish women's movement like talks about women and nature where I'm a bit like, whoa, like don't tell me that I've got some weird like mystical natural link with the natural world just because I'm a woman. Like, is it because I, you know, is it is it really rooted in the idea that like all women have uteruses and make babies or like the women are like all connected to some kind of like, you know, mystical mother goddess figure. And I think like, you know, at this point, I can't really like speak for the whole Kurdish women's movement because there's a huge range of like analyses and like depth as well that I don't even, you know, understand fully. Um, but I can kind of speak for myself as someone who comes um, from like a background of like queer politics, like as a queer person, as someone who in general would like to on some level abolish gender um, rather than kind of um, celebrate an idea of like womanhood that's like very like natural and holistic and, and la-di-da. Um, but I guess so speaking for myself, I think 
there is um, its importance to recognize, as actually in the writings of the Kurdish freedom movement does, that like we are talking about like women as, a, as something that's constructed socially, that we're looking actually across of thousands of years of society creating our idea of what um, womanhood is and kind of working within that. And I think something that the Kurdish freedom movement does in a really interesting way is to um, navigate that dialogue between this system and kind of ourselves. And there's a workshop later today on the kind of process of critic, critic self-critic of the Kurdish freedom movement, um, which speaks a lot about this kind of question of like, so there's the system and then there's the system as we internalize it into ourselves. And then there's liberation enacted through kind of how we change ourselves and then also through how we change the system and how these aren't two separate spheres of action. There isn't personal change and system change, that they're in constant dialogue with each other. And if we want to um, liberate ourselves, we need to do it both on a personal level and on a systemic level. And so I think for me, this kind of question of like, are, does the category of woman even exist? Like, in some ways it's like, well, because society has said it does, that's something we need to work with, but that doesn't mean that at the same time in parallel, we can't start kind of deconstructing ideas of gender at the same time. Um, okay, there's some nice comments around, yeah, there's like a lot of parallels around kind of how we kind of exploit, abuse, ravage and extract from nature and also from women and kind of something that um katie said as well about like we get we get um worth you know we get value from women and from nature um as well um yeah and molly kind of mentioned um bookchin's ecology of freedom and that was yeah a big influence of the kurdish freedom movement um i will kind of say just because i see this quite a lot that I'm not saying you're doing this at all, um, whoever put that in the chat, but some people kind of say like, oh yeah, there's like a social ecology revolution. There's like a Bookchin revolution happening in North and East Syria. And I think it's also really important to remember that like what's happening in North and East Syria and across Kurdistan like really exists in its own ideological space. Um, and actually like speaking specifically, like as someone who comes from like the UK anarchist movement, it was really tempting to go to Rojava and be like, it's an anarchist revolution, amazing. Um, and like on some level it is, but on most levels, like it just totally isn't. Like it's not anarchism, it's not socialism in a traditional way. Like it's really its own thing. Um, and we really need to take it kind of as that and not like project. I had to struggle to not project my own politics onto it while I was there and kind of be able to sit with what it was and try to understand it um, and then try to understand it deeper and then again and again. Um, so yeah, back over to you, Sam. Yeah, well, I guess you, you're, I mean, you've started to talk about it, but uh, yeah, the, the, the differences between that approach and the sort of Western ecological and feminist approaches. Yeah, so I think really kind of looking at how, um, we tend to see ecology and feminism as like an issue here, which really, and because then like full commitment, this kind of prioritization of either ecology or gender liberation kind of then sits within like a, a specific sector of the movement or a specific movement within this kind of like wider movement with like a capital M if we have one of those um, here means that we don't have this kind of collective buy-in in a way which translates to like practical um, readjustment of how we organize and what our priorities are. Um, so something that I was really blown away by in Rojava was how integrated these kind of questions of gender liberation are within all, all spheres of organizing. Um, oh, and I was gonna share my screen at this point. So, cause I have some photos I want to share with you guys. Um, so yeah, kind of this kind of question of like, how does it look like in the um, sort of practical applications? Um, you get a, an integration, for example, of um, ecology and economy, which is something that like, I've always really reacted against very strongly in the UK context. Um, but it actually really works in the context of North and East Syria because um, the fundamental value of ecology and liberation is like at the foundational level, right? So when people say economy, they mean an economy which is ecological, an economy which empowers women, an ecology which centers democracy, 
um, an, eco an economy that doesn't serve like corporations or the state, um, which is pretty cool. So this is a picture of a women's agricultural cooperative. And there's just like loads and loads of those across Rojava. Um, there's a kind of bureau called Aboria Jin, which translates to women's economy. Um, and their job is to kind of like empower women through um, econ economy projects, many of which are ecological. So there's a lot of kind of like food growing and things like that. Um, kick. Um, and then one example that I'm guessing a lot of you guys have probably heard about is Jinwar, which is the women's village. Um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to hold up this example of like Jinwar, which a lot of you guys have probably heard about. Yeah, yeah, I'll send over the photos um, in the chat next time someone else is talking, um, which is a village that was set up um, in partnership with like the women's movement and the Women's Economy Bureau and the kind of movement in general where they got a piece of land and it's a place where women and their children can leave. Some of the women have moved there because they've never married. Other women have moved there because their husbands have died. Other women have moved there in order to leave like an abusive or unhappy uh, marriage. Um, and so it's just a handful of women. It's like a dozen women or something and like a bunch of kids. And they have a shared collective village economy where they all work in the village um, bakery and the village kind of, they have a bunch of fields. They have a little shop. Um, they kind of make sort of herbs and you know kind of preserves things like that and through their participation in that economy they then receive like a monthly stipend depending on um depending on kind of how many kids there are living in that house as well they all the houses are built with a traditional kind of like um adobe cob uh, it's called kepich um sort of clay and straw and i think manure mix um so they're very like ecological as well um they've got some solar panels uh and it's a wonderful, beautiful place. And in some ways it's quite a small project and you can kind of Im imagine a project like that existing um, in somewhere in the UK and not kind of bat an eyelid, but the fact that it exists in North and East Syria, which kind of has very different social norms, but also that it exists as part of this, because it's so connected to the wider movement and you have women from across North and, North and East Syria coming, like one of the pictures is of a bunch of women at Jinwar having an education around like women's liberation and women's history. They um, have like a natural health academy where women will come and learn about like herbal medicine and kind of more holistic forms of health. That because it's so linked into this wider movement, it actually then becomes like a magnifying glass for the whole movement, as opposed to kind of an isolated kind of sell somewhere that's not really connected so it's a really really beautiful project and projects like that projects which are inspired by the same values kind of exist all across um rojava um so that's kind of like a specific example that has quite a lot to do with like ecology as well as like the women's agricultural co-ops but i think it's also really important to think about again how does it work on an integrated level like in a way that isn't on the surface of it about like ecology or about women's liberation but still kind of like has that sort of impact um and i think like for me there's something really important about kind of how the movement conceptualizes power and thinks about power in a way which rejects the sort of patriarchal masculine views of power and embraces kinds of power which are more rooted in like the women's movement and how women tend to organize um, and therefore actually sees women as the leaders of the revolution. Um, so like, what does this mean that women are the leaders of the revolution? It means like practical transfer of like power. That means political power, organizational power. It means finances, like financial resources are directed towards women's movement. Um, it's ideological power as well. Like women are, well, women take and create uh, spaces in which to come up with like movement analysis and movement ideology. Um, and it also means military power in the context. So you have like the YPJ, which are the women's defense forces. But then you also have, um, you know, like the, women's community defense forces which are mostly like older women you know like mums and nans with like ak-47s who patrol the neighborhood in a much more of a community-centered way instead of having like police coming from outside and there's been a lot of discussion in recent months about what a sort of post-police society looks like um and i think rojaba does um have a lot of interesting examples about what it means for a community to actually defend itself um 
in in both like a practical like physical way from like actual violence but also um, conceptualizing self-defense as education as organization um, as education um, so so yeah so I think this kind of like um, complete reconceptualization of what power looks like and so I kind of just want to speak about, for a couple of minutes about what um, the women's movement looks like in Rojava for, for those who don't know, because I think it's really mind blowing before we then maybe start wrapping up and um, having questions. But um, so essentially that there, there is an autonomous women's movement, um, which runs parallel to the general movement. So every single institution, whether it's a cooperative or a union or an assembly, from the very local neighborhood level all the way to the whole of North and East Syria. And in fact, for the whole Kurdish freedom movement, which is active across the whole world, um, there is a parallel women's structure. Um, it doesn't mean that there's a men's structure and a women's structure. There's a mixed gender structure in which women have to hold 50% of leadership positions. So every single leadership position is held by a man and a woman. And then in addition to that, you have a women's structure which then will have two women co-chairs, which essentially means that 75% of the political leaders, union leaders, community organization leaders, cooperative leaders, neighborhood council leaders are women. Um, so that's huge. You know, that's a movement saying we don't just believe, we don't just pay lip service to women's power, we actually give them power. Um, it is unacceptable and invalid for any men, men to make decisions on their own. Um, without a woman there representing the kind of women's structures and and in general. So um, if a group of men do get together, make a decision, that decision is then automatically invalid. Um, so I think just thinking on that scale is really kind of mind blowing. And, and then remembering that, first of all, like in Rojava or rather in North and East Syria, like this is an area that has like a population of like four or five million people. Like it's not a small region. Um, in terms of Kurdistan, there is somewhere between like 20 and 30 million Kurdish people living in Kurdistan. Um, and then also other um, ethnic groups which participate in the system. And then in terms of the Kurdish movement kind of globally, like the Kurdish diaspora exists in all around the world, but particularly in the Middle East and Europe um, and within your communities. Um, in Edinburgh or wherever else you're dialing into, like there is a Kurdish assembly that operates on those principles as well. Um, so yeah, I think we need to really think about how then do we integrate these ideas um, of power, of leadership um, in a way which actually challenges a more kind of patriarchal way of looking at it. That's great, thanks. Um... Should we open up to questions now in the chat? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I'll try to share the files in the chat. And also, um, there was Molly there, had a question earlier on. Yeah, um, about oil resources um, and whether there's internal tensions. Okay, so a lot of the reason the surrounding state powers are so pressed to have control of Kurdistan is because of its oil resources. I wonder if you could talk a little bit, bit about what the conversation about that is like within communities in Rojava. Are there internal tensions with people who would like Kurdistan to be an independent petro state? Yes, yes, there are. Um, yeah, certainly don't want to kind of portray like Kurdish people like in this sort of homogenous way where they all believe the same thing. Like, there is a lot of diversity, like the Kurdish freedom movement, as I refer to it, which um, is the kind of umbrella ideological sort of network, which includes um, the Rojava revolution, which includes the PKK which includes the HDP um, political party in um, Turkish Kurdistan in Turkey. Um, you know, these within this kind of like, um, I guess, ideological strain, this thread um, there, it, that's the one that's kind of based on the kind of like democracy, women's liberation, ecology. Um, there are also other strains of within kind of the Kurdish people that's particularly um, active in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, where the the idea is very much around like Kurdish national liberation, but in quite a nationalist way, in quite a state-centered way, in a way which doesn't particularly um, acknowledge the importance of women's liberation um, 
economic equity or ecology. So for example, you see in Iraqi Kurdistan, you have the Barzani family who essentially are one of the most corrupt kind of like ruling powers um, in the world um, and use the oil resources to prop up like the wealth of a small elite who holds state power. And then everyone else is just kind of thrown under the bus, um, including women. Um, in terms of like within Rojava, it's really interesting because yeah, it's an ecological revolution that gets a lot of its money through petrol extraction, um, both in the oil fields in Rimelan, which is like in the kind of Kurdish majority region, but also now in Deir Ezzor, which is an Arab majority region that was only liberated from ISIS just over a year ago. Um, and I think it is just one of those things that it's one of those contradictions that you have to sit with and within the movement, you know, even in the kind of academy where they talk about petrochemicals and they kind of train up scientists to be able to like operate the oil fields and things like that. They also talk about like, well, what does sustainable oil extraction look like? How do we minimize it? Um, and kind of constantly looking for particularly solar power alternatives um, as well. All right, um, difficult ecological questions to experts and has something to do with the hierarchy and expertise driven work culture but in some ways I understand it since ecological environmental issues can be super complicated and need to be studied scientifically in order to be understood and applied accordingly how does this compare to the situation in Rojava are there professional ecologists or academics and if so what capacity do they have to undertake scientific studies how are they viewed and how do they communicate with the rest of the community um, yeah that's really interesting because yeah that kind of balance between like democracy and expertise and kind of getting buy-in from people is definitely a live issue anywhere. Um, there are specific organizations set up to focus particularly on ecological issues. So for example, you'll have like the, um, a, a specific institution that focuses on like soil health and they'll kind of work within like the, um, in partnership with like agricultural commissions and the economy commission and they're all linked in i think that's the kind of important thing to remember that like all of these different organizations are linked together through like the ecology committees of um the it's really hard to kind of talk about anything with them than opening up a whole different can of worms um but the idea is that the political system is completely based on like localized democratic participation so from your smallest kind of like neighborhood commune, which will usually have between a few hundred and a couple thousand people in it, to the whole federation of North and East Syria, which involves like four million people on every single level of that federation. There's like seven levels or something. Um, you have an ecology committee that people sit on um, and are involved in. Um, and then like, I guess it's hard to say this without it seeming really superficial, but like education is absolutely crucial to um, the work of the movement um, and that involves like education around women's liberation education around ecology um, and they don't just do it in a sort of like hey there's an education coming who wants to go um, but like embedded in like the changing the school curriculum like in the refugee camps you know there's like academies operating in refugee camps there's academies operating in every women's center um, it's so it's really hard to avoid education in like quite a significant way you know where like you really are fully absorbed into both like really technical aspects of education but like always always zooming out and looking at the values and principles and vision um, like we used to joke that you can't ask anybody anyone from the movement in Rojava any question without them saying well 5,000 years ago, <laughs> when Neolithic society transitioned into a state-based system and patriarchy was first formed, like people really kind of always keep that bigger picture in mind. Um, and I think that's actually a real value. So even though it's kind of funny sometimes because you're like, I literally just want to know like what you're doing right now and you're telling me about Neolithic society, um, that ability to hold the big picture in your brain is I think what gives people the ability to fight um, be, in inconceivably adverse circumstances, um, you know, like plowing a field and then that field being shelled by like Turkish artillery for a whole season and coming back and like doing it again, like people are, are able to be so strong and so focused on their vision and willing to give so much of themselves because they really know what they believe in. And that's a really, I think that's something we could really learn from. Um, how would you apply what you have seen? Oh, it's moving. <laughs> 
how would you apply what you have seen operating there to the organizations here? Is there anything that just wouldn't work here? Yeah, so I mean, I think, um, first of all, it goes without saying that anything um, that's happening over there would look different over here. You know, so nobody's arguing that we need to just like lift stuff up from Rojava or Kurdistan and like drop it down here. Um, at the same time, I think it's really interesting if we challenge ourselves to, um, if we put ourselves in uncomfortable situations and actually learn to organize in very different ways. Um, because fundamentally, like the track record of the Kurdish freedom movement is pretty astounding and we haven't quite managed anything close to that scale here. That's not to say that we don't do amazing stuff all the time, like in, in Europe, in the you know, so-called UK, in, in the West, um, whatever that is, like we do really amazing things, but I think whatever the, the level of amazing we're at, like we need to multiply times 10 if we want to effectively counter the threats that we're facing from state violence, from far right nationalism, from ecological destruction, from patriarchy. Um, so there's so much that we could learn. Um, and I think what I was saying about the women's structures is, is crucial. I think we need to start organizing like autonomous structures for people without gender privilege or for people who have experience of womanhood. Like I think we obviously need to think about how we do that in a way um, which fits to our, our context and our values. Um, but I really think that we need to start finding ways of transferring power away from cis men um, and be kind of and apply that kind of understanding um, of power and oppression. Um, I think we need to start thinking of ecology as like a worldview. And I think we need to, um, and this is gonna sound super hippie. So like, I'm, you know, sorry, not sorry. But um, after working for a lot of years in like the community food movement, where you actually develop a relationship with a piece of land, um, it fundamentally changed the way I think about the world because I now have like the natural world as a reference point to how things work. Um, and I think like permaculture is quite an interesting model for this. Like I think, you know, we're not gonna have a whole talk about permaculture in the various bits in which it's like problematic or whatever. But if you just kind of look at the basic principles and values of permaculture um, and how you can apply them to not just a physical kind of agricultural space, but to our organizations, I think um, I see a lot of parallels with, what, with what's happening in the Kurdish freedom movement um, of really seeing things holistically um, and not having this thing where we see kind of each other in a really rational analytical way as like these separate bodies, separate campaigns, but to really think about like, what does it mean to build a social movement that's modeled on an ecosystem, which means that we don't you know, like the, the trees and the bees and the birds and the worms and the fungi aren't these like separate entities. And when you stick them all together, you suddenly have like a forest, right? Like a forest is actually made up of the relationships between all of these entities, how they interact and how they support each other. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't exist in some kind of conflict or tension or contradiction. Um, but actually they have a shared purpose and that purpose is survival and the maintenance of that ecosystem. Um, and so I think to a certain extent, we need to think about how we can bring our social movements together. So we think about what's our shared purpose. How do we strengthen the relationships between the different groups and campaigns and initiatives um, and find a way to actually be like a stronger whole in some way. Um, I'm just gonna read another question yeah we do we need to wrap up about uh in, in about five minutes um okay. but yeah read those questions out um so this kind of question around like the tendency of see the kind of Kurdish revolution as a subject to be studied and have a desire to learn from and apply lessons to our own struggles outside of the Middle East. Um, yeah, I can't quite read all of this right now, but I think specifically to that, because that's also some a point I wanted to make is this question of like, um, for me, the most important thing that we could do is to not only act in solidarity with the Kurdish freedom movement, although that's also really important. Um, but to see ourselves as part of it like this is a movement that we can learn so much from and that we're being actively invited to join you know the kurdish 
friends in Rojava, in Baku or Turkish Kurdistan, in the UK are all saying that they actually want us all to be part of this movement and they want us to see each other as like comrades, um, which means like, yes, being in solidarity with, but not in this kind of way where you hold something up as holy and perfect. And, but actually you need to get in there. You need to kind of get messy and see the imperfections and engage with it in a way in which you're like mindful of like the privilege and kind of oppressive mindset that you've internalized from being, you know, from the West or whatever but to be able to like get in there and like debate things and like give, um, you know, for example, the Kurdish revolutionaries in Rojava would get really angry at us if we wouldn't give them criticism, if we wouldn't criticize how they were doing things. Cause they were like, do you think that like, we're not like strong enough or like resilient enough or kind of, we're not able to take criticism. Like we want your criticism. We want your perspective on things. If we disagree with you, we'll tell you, don't worry. Like we'll let you know, but at the same time, like we all have valuable perspectives we can share with each other. Um, so I think, yeah, we really need to engage with it, not as something that's like, yeah, this kind of romantic exotic thing that could never happen here but as this like kind of messy chaotic process that's largely like riding on the um and um, yeah the kind of the bravery the courage and the vision and the commitment and dedication of a bunch of people who are very much like us you know it's not they're not a different you know species it's people who have decided have made some really tough hard decisions in their lives in order to fight for freedom and dignity and democracy and i think we can all identify with that and we can draw strength from that and at the same time give strength by saying hey we're standing with you um and not just standing with you and your struggle over there but we're gonna like sow the seeds here for our own revolution whatever that looks like and build a completely different kind of society here which will support and stand side by side with the rojava revolution with democratic confederalism in Kurdish Turkey, with the Zapatista revolution, you know, with all of these different movements around the world and actually kind of take our place um, in, that, in that amazing kind of movement for global democracy that actually we have been seeing over the past couple of decades and which is really reaching quite a, a fever pitch now if you look around the world like people are done, people are sick of the system as it is and we need to, you know, pull our socks up and like get to work and like get serious about what it means to really fight for fight for a different kind of world that's great um in terms of uh if people want to get involved in um uh sort of the Kurdish uh freedom movement or in um stuff that's happening in britain is there any events coming up or anything that people can can do yes thank you um, okay, so I'm also super quick trying to share those um, files, those photos, just so people can see. And if not, maybe I can just send them over. I'll see if they, um... oh, it's going to take a long time because it's making me do them one by one. There's one of them. It's nice. Um, so first of all, like this weekend is a global weekend of action that's been called by the Rise of Rojava, Women Defend Rojava and Make Rojava Green Again campaigns. Um, so specifically in Scotland, um, Scotland Friends of Kurdistan are organizing like some online um, presence and shows of solidarity for people who are in different parts of the UK. If you look on the Kurdistan Solidarity Network Facebook or Twitter or website, it has information about different local events happening, some socially distanced demos and a lot of stuff online. Um, and in general, like trying to get involved with a local solidarity group is fantastic. Getting to know your local Kurdish assembly is also fantastic. Um, and in terms of like practical solidarity, I believe that the water in Mesopotamia campaign is still taking PayPal donations and they're fundraising to bring money over to Rojava in order to kind of like increase access to water and water sustainability. It's a really fantastic, fantastic campaign that's just directing money directly to the movement to do kind of ecological water stuff instead of like channeling it through like dodgy NGOs or whatever. Um, and I think a lot of it though is about like focusing as well on your movements here, but doing it consciously, like learning from the revolution, like reading the literature that comes out of the Roja revolution. Um, oh, thank you, Joe. Um, and I'm actually gonna also copy and paste 
some book suggestions and this is like my my holy trinity of um books that i think really speak really well to the um question of like ecology and feminism and how that works um and one of them is coming straight from the kurdish freedom movement and two others are just um coming from um north america and i think it's just really important to like notice that connection that there's like a lot of the thinking like really resonates with each other and we can find ways to be in dialogue with each other um so i also really recommend people check out those the revolutionary education brochure is one of the best kind of like most accessible summaries of movement analysis that i've come across so i do really recommend that okay i'm done <laughs> Thank you everybody for listening.